Please turn, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Last week, we saw how we are all needed in the body of Christ. What a, a, a God-designed and, and intended parts for us to play in the body of Christ. And I, I pray and I trust that you were encouraged, both encouraged and rightly exhorted, to see your place here in the body of Christ to be able to build one another up in Christ, to press on for the glory of God together in Christ. This week, we come to the love chapter, if you will, in the Bible. It's the most quoted chapter in the Bible. Not Maybe not the verse, but the most quoted chapter in the Bible, the most often used scripture at all weddings, for very obvious reasons. It expresses both beautifully and vividly and lyrically love. But far too often it's taken, if you will, almost ripped out of its context, made to stand alone. And that is not Paul's intention to give us a piece of scripture outside of its context. The context is spiritual matters, spiritual things. The Corinthians want to define their spirituality, how how great they are, their, their superness, if you will, based on their gifts instead of God himself, the Holy Spirit. Paul has urged them to desire and seek the gifts very earnestly, but not for themselves, which was what the problem was. Gifts are for the building up of the body of Christ, for the serving of God's means and ends. The the gifts reveal the activity and the presence and the heart of God in and to and through his church. And the Corinthians have ended up prizing the gifts given to them over the giver of those gifts. And in this chapter, all Christians, Paul's teaching for all Christians, not just the Corinthians, but for the church forever until Christ returns, that there is a more excellent way than the spiritual gifts. So pray with me just for a moment as we begin. Spirit of God, I pray you do your work this morning through your word. Yes and amen, Jesse's prayer, that we would hear you and not the speaker at all. I pray that we would see and remember and encounter love this morning and then being filled with love, go in love towards one another. I pray, Lord, that we would be what you have designed us to be, what you, have, what you are teaching us to be, what you are instructing us to be as the body of Christ. Those in Christ meant to make visible Christ with our lives and through the gifts to build one another up in Christ. I pray that this would be done this morning by you alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there are over, estimated over, I could not get an actual amount because I think it's more, but estimated over 100 million songs written about love. And the variety Good luck trying to pick what kind of categories there are, how kind of genres there are. Just over a hundred million songs written about love. And not only just a hundred million songs written about love, but then vigorous, serious, agony-producing debates about which song is the best. And if I were to ask you what is your favorite song or the best song, there might be some agreement and there might be heated lively discussion about what is the greatest love song you could find. Anything from Unchained Melody to At Last to Stand By Me to the song that I'm about to sing for you, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. Yeah. I'm just going to allow you to think of what I would look like singing it in your head because to sing it for you would actually not be loving. It would be the opposite of love it would be to cause you pain and bring you much enjoyment, but mainly pain. Love is such an, a widely sung, 
a, a widely sung category. It's such a, a widely known category because it's a universal emotion that we can all relate to in some way, shape, or form. Whether we have known it and experienced it or whether we have known the absence of it and the opposite of love, we all desire it. We desire to receive it, to know it. We desire to give it. And yet it can be also the one thing that we feel that we can feel as most lacking, most not present. So very much not different than the church in Corinth. The main point that Paul is, the main thing I will say that Paul is doing in this passage is he's issuing a call. He's issuing an instructive, adjusting, but loving call. And not just the immediate call that we might go to to say a call to go in love, but he first issues a call to come to love himself. A call to come to the one who personifies love, who defines love, to see love and know love. And then from there, you cannot help but to then go and do all, to be all in love. At the end of chapter 12, Paul says, I will show you a still more excellent way. He's talking about the gifts, the spiritual gifts. He says, I will show you a still more excellent way. And so Paul calls us to the greatest and most excellent of ways, a, a love of Christ, a love for others. And in these verses, Paul teaches us and shows us the necessity of love. Verses one through three, the character of love verses 4 through 7, and the permanence of love, verses 8 through 12. And these are going to form our walk through the Scripture this morning. So let us start with the necessity of love and read along with me in the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. See, Paul begins his at first my, my peer deviation, this little detour about the spiritual gifts, with an excellent description of the ways that are both, that are excellent and beyond comparison in this if-then scenario. So if I have X but not love, then fill in the blank. Paul is masterfully using rhetorical effect here. He's not asking a question and expecting them to answer it. He's, he's presenting a question, an issue, a very real context, specific issue in their life and giving them the answer. He mentions gifts and allows those spiritual people that are in their midst to think that they are being called on stage for their moment of glory about prophecy and, and tongues and gifts of all faith and knowledge and the laying down of your very life. Please come up on stage, all of you. Stand here for your moment in the sun before pulling the carpet out from under them by calling into question the adequacy of their gift. What is at stake here in these opening verses? What is at stake in our relationship together is not the gift, but the person. Paul's not pitting love against the gifts of the Spirit. It's not, well, the gifts are dangerous and you misuse them, so stay away from them until you're positioned and ready to come. He's, he's not saying it's either love or the gifts. There is no distinction there. What's at stake here is the person, and Gordon Fee helps us understand this well when he says, it is not a matter of these things or love or even these things motivated by love. But these things by a person whose whole life is otherwise also given to love. 
See, there are two opposing views on this page in Scripture about what it meant to be a spiritual person. The Corinthian view and Paul's view. For the Corinthians to be a spiritual person, it meant ultimately to have tongues and knowledge and wisdom, the great gifts of God. But it also meant for them without concern, so to have them but without concern for the true Christian behavior. What defines me, what makes me great, what makes me who I am in Christ is this. I have no regard or very little regard for how then I am to live, for my behavior in life. And then for Paul, the truly spiritual person was the one full of the Holy Spirit, which meant that Christ had saved them and had become Savior and Lord, which then meant to live as Christ by walking in love. Instead of fighting for spiritual recognition themselves, they should have been concerned with building up one another and expressing love of Christ to each other. Love is absolutely necessary for a Christian. It is what we have known from our Savior. It's what we live and talk and walk in moment by moment. It's the very marrow of our life. Love is indispensably necessary. And in verse 1, Paul uses the gifts that they prized most to reveal the flaw of their spirituality. Paul's concern shows that their spirituality shows all kinds of flaws. It's not just you have a, a slightly wrong way of thinking. It's that this is so flawed that it's, it's eroding, it's affecting, it's destroying, it's tearing down and breaking down the very relationships you have. We've seen in our series how their knowledge led to pride and destruction of a brother for whom Christ died. We've seen how their wisdom led to quarrels and rivalry. We've seen how their tongues were not edifying and building up the community, but really causing division and separation and, and tearing others down. Their, their spirituality lacked the primary evidence of the Spirit, which is love. To speak in tongues as they were doing, if you will, and to them a, a language of the heavens to, in their mindset. I, I have a language of the heavens, a super spiritual language. To speak in tongues as they were doing not only does not build up the body of Christ, it actually made them disruptive, off-putting, and repelling. A noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And because of their gifts and their mind, they should have been drawing people and all. It's like, oh, you have the ability to speak in tongues and interpret them. Just come gather around and sit at my feet. I will let you bask in my presence. This is what it meant in their mind. This is what they think they are doing. They think they're giving their greatest gifts for the, the greatest good. But they're, they're not. They're not even close. Because without love, it's having the opposite effect. They're not just speaking unintelligible words, as some might say of speaking in tongues, they are actually causing others irritation when they speak, discomfort when they speak. People are being driven from their presence. They are off-putting, and ultimately, ultimately they sound like pagans, not Christians, just babbling at the mouth. The love of Christ in verse 1, the love of Christ is meant to have a drawing effect, an invitation, a loving, building up invitation to Christ, from Christ, for Christ. Love is necessary for without it left to ourselves, we are disruptive, off-putting, repelling to others, a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. But that's not all that we are without love. For in verse 2, Paul expands this list from what they prized most to this wide range of what many would consider super or powerful gifts. If one were to have the gift of prophecy or all wisdom and understanding and the kind of faith that could move mountains, that would be impressive, right? I would love to see that. I, I would love to have that. I would, my faith in God would be would probably go off the charts if I watched 
Wayne or Jesse or, or Ray or Dan Walkman say, I have faith that that car is going to go from there to the other side of the city. And it did. I would, my, my jaw would drop to the floor. Like, that is incredible. My temptation in that moment would be to worship the person and not the God whose faith is in. You can have all of these gifts, but have not love in them, then the person's measure, as what God says, is as nothing in the sight of God. What we can be impressed with, what we can be affected by, without love, God says, is actually worth nothing. You might have vivid and stirring words of prophecy or encouragement to build others up. You might have wisdom that seems to come from heaven itself. You might have the kind of faith that can literally move a mountain from one location to other. But if you have not love, you are nothing. Let that sink in for a moment. It's not just a true statement that we can say, yes, I acknowledge that. It is meant to have an effect. It gets at the very heart of what Paul is speaking to. It might be easy for us to not feel the weight of what Paul is saying in these verses because we don't have the gifts that he mentions here. Maybe I don't have this gift, or I don't have that gift, or I I don't have these, so I, I don't feel it as much. Regardless of the gifts named here or not named here, there is a profound significance for all Christians. While we might have these, we, have, we do have others. And the heart that is unmasked by Paul here is one that prizes the gifts, that, that prizes the self, that idolizes and worships me in such a way that instead of worshiping the giver of those gifts, you regularly confuse your identity with those gifts. So what this can look like for anyone tempted, and I mean by anyone, that's usually all of us are tempted in this way, is to think, I have these gifts, this is who I am, and now I mistake who I am as associated to these gifts as a, instead of who I am is Christ's alone. There's not only an identity issue, there's a motivation issue, there's a worship issue. Who you are is not tied up in your giftedness. Who you are is not tied up in your giftedness. Your value is not tied up in your giftedness. Your worth is not tied up in your giftedness. It is in Christ alone is your identity, is your value, is your Worth and the gifts are intended not only to bring him glory and serve you and worshiping him more and loving him more, but to do the same to others, to love and build up others. See, Christ is all and everything to you, or he isn't. He's all and everything to you, or he isn't. If he is, then you know his love and are filled with his love towards others. If he isn't, then you are, then you know, then what you know are constantly moving the lines and trying to define what love is and isn't, which means that you are nothing. In our self-centered, self-glorifying pursuit to be seen as super spiritual, we are actually seen to be devoid of the love of Christ, which means we are actually nothing in our striving to be something. Love is absolutely necessary, for without love we are disruptive, off-putting, and nothing. And But Paul's not done with the Corinthian church yet. He's not done with us yet in what, why love is absolutely necessary, because in verse 3 he adds this another layer and then expands his argument even more. In verse 3, excuse me, these are examples of great personal sacrifice, of of sacrifice that can cost you even life itself. You can give away all of your earthly belongings and sacrifice yourself to the point of death, but if that person has not love, then they profit nothing. 
While the sacrifices are of value, the one who does such things without love gains nothing at all. And actually then that means they're spiritually bankrupt. It's not that they remain neutral. It's not that they remain where they are. It's that they're spiritually bankrupt. So many times we can, cre- we can treat the Christian life, our, our relationships with one another, and our relationship with God as an investment system. Well, I'm going to sow this and invest this here so that I can get back ultimately for me. It's a matter of wisdom and pragmatic decision, not a relationship with Christ himself. And, Christ, and what Paul is instructing here is that you do not give to get. You cannot sow for yourself and expect to receive from God. It's important to understand it again and remind us because it can be so easy in this, in this conversation to want to immediately pit love and the gifts against each other. And you're going to be saying this several times. Paul is not pitting loves and the gifts in, against each other. He's using them to contrast the real issue for them. We are instructed to desire and seek the gifts, but not as the end themselves, as the means to glorify God by loving him and building others up in him. A person with the gifts that are described in these three verses would appear to be invaluable to the body of Christ. Indispensable to the church. But God who sees below the surface level into the heart of a person says that while having these gifts may appear impressive maybe to that person or about that person, that person who does not have genuine love is ultimately worthless. Without love, we are disruptive, repelling, nothing. We profit nothing. We are spiritually bankrupt. Love is necessity to the Christian just as morrow is to the human body. You cannot take it out. It cannot be divided. It cannot be separated. It cannot be only used sometimes and then not in others. It is the very essence of who we are in Christ. So let me ask you a question. Do you have genuine Christ-like love for others here? And not just selectively, not just situationally, but individually and corporately. Or do you treat love more like a commodity instead of a necessity? Meaning, do you selectively choose when to give it, when to use it, when to extend it, and conversely, when to pull it back and withhold it and make others feel the absence of it? It is both a commodity and potentially a weapon in your hands. If in your heart you aren't truly loving others here, then the application is to consider the love of Christ for you first. It's not then just, well, go love somebody. That would be virtually impossible with us. The application first is if in your heart you, don't, you struggle with love or are tempted towards not loving other people, then it's first to consider the love of Christ for you, first and foremost, as the one who needs it most, who has known it most, the love that has saved you and drawn you and sustains you and strengthens you, the love that hung on a cross for you, a love that lives sinlessly for you, a love that died for you, a love that rose for you, a love that is still active and present within you. Consider and remember that you are not a deserving recipient of his love. You're actually deserving of the, F, of the opposite effect of his love because of sinfulness. And as you recall it and rehearse the love of God that you know, you will find your heart transformed to the necessity of love. And then you cannot help but then have love that goes to those around you, a love that is absolutely necessary, but a love that is also, another way of saying love is absolutely essential in every relationship that we have. And so while love is absolutely necessary, and I don't think there's a human being that would argue with Paul, we absolutely agree with you that love is necessary and it's needed and it's essential. But where we can get ourselves into the weeds is then what is love? What is love? And so Paul, over the, these middle verses of verses 4 through 7, answers the question of what love is by showing the character of love. Look at verse 4 with me, and read, I'll read through this, verses 4 through 7. Love is 
patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Paul lists 15 characteristics of love in these verses. This is not an exhaustive list. This is not a comprehensive list. But these are characteristics of love that are absolutely necessary, and they're specific not only to the Corinthians, but specific to us. He describes what love is and is not here. He says what love is in the positive, and he says what love isn't in the negative. And love is not some abstract quality, nor simply just some emotion that we feel. Love is defined for us here. It's, it's, it's described for us here. Love is personified for us here because love is ultimately defined for us in Christ. In 1 John three sixteen, it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And not just ultimately defined what love is, but there is no greater form of love than what Christ has done for us, where John 15, 13 reminds us, by, by this greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So as we consider the character of love, let us be freshly affected of the love of Christ demonstrated in these ways, first and foremost to us through Christ, and then to others. And I'm just going to admit to you all right now, the challenge with teaching, the challenge with preaching this subject matter is you immediately feel how unloving you are, how impatient you are. No pastor steps into a pulpit as the example of what they are preaching, but we preach faithfully and completely inadequately and trusting in the Lord. And so I by no means am preaching to you as an authority on love. I'm much more probably the authority on the struggle of what it means to love myself and not others. While this is an exhortation and a call to love, this is also a gracious reminder and invitation to all this morning. The love of Christ demonstrated that we receive and know as we not only have relationship with God, but as we live with others. So what is love? And Paul says love is, first, patient and kind. See, these represent loves necessary both passive and active responses towards others. One, quite literally, the the patient's more literally translated be one who suffers long. One long-suffering in love. And the other picture's active goodness. So one in long-suffering and one in active goodness. They, They represent, they find their ultimate definition in God towards humanity. Long suffering and active goodness. Long patience, endurance, moving towards always with active goodness. Love is patient and kind. It is patient in the Father and the God because he holds back his, his wrath on human rebellion. And on the other hand, his kindness is found in the millions of examples of grace and mercy and none greater than Christ on the cross for us. Christ, the greatest example of patience and kindness towards those who deserve nothing but judgment and wrath. And as Christ's people who have received this and know this and live in this reality, the implication is for us to love others with patience and kindness, excuse me, with long-suffering and active goodness regardless of the situation, of the context, of the relationship. 
Love, is, love also does not envy or jealousy more simply. Love does not allow fellow believers to be in rivalry or competition for positions or to gain favor or worship or praise. This verb was used back in chapter 3, verse 3, to describe the strife that was coming from their rivalry over their favorite teachers. Love actually seeks to serve those for whom Christ died, whatever my own personal desires. Love also does not boast. It means to not behave as a... We understand what brag means, but it comes from the word braggart. It means not, we must not be braggarts or windbags. So many times when I think of this, and this week we watched the comedian, I forget who it was. If you remember, Kelly, just say the name out loud. Where this, this comedian used the example of a uh, Scottish bagpipes. Brian Regan, thank, thank you. She parted through her brain to me with her eyes. And I always think of, when he said it very accurately, and, and I always think of when I hear Scottish bagpipes, that eventually it sounds like it's supposed to sound good. There's a, oh, I can feel that. that that's right. But when it starts, it's always hard to, hurt, hurt, and you're kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm ready. Whenever you want to really get going to so the good part, I'm ready. But until then, it's just kind of, it's, it's stopping. It's, it's like, I know the good part's coming, but right now it's literally nothing more than a bag full of wind that makes noises and is off-putting. That's what we do when we boast in ourselves. It's become windbags that have off-putting sounds that is self-centered in action and purpose and desires to call attention to us. Love is not this way. This, this boasting seeks personal glory, and the effect is that it wounds others. You cannot boast and love at the same time. The boastful heart wants others to think highly of me, whether deserving or not, whereas love doesn't even get on that conversation because love cares not for it. Love boasts in Christ and builds others up. The only category of me and boasting in love is that I have nothing to boast of and I want to love others as Christ has loved me. So it does not boast. And it is also, love is not arrogant. It is, it is arrogant means to be puffed up. It's used extensively in this letter to describe the Corinthians. To be arrogant in the face of so much that is unholy and unloving is grievous to the Lord. Love, in opposition to this, is constructive and it builds up. Arrogance blows up the building. If you want to think about it from the body of Christ, the church, arrogance will blow up the body of Christ where love will build it up. We, are, we all like to be made much of, left to ourselves. We, we like to be admired. We like it when people notice our successes and completely, completely miss our failures. We don't like it when people make fun or criticize or laugh at us. I think we are very aware of how boasting works and what it looks like, but there are some very many and very subtle and very refined ways of expressing our pride than boasting. While we might not give in to stay in the middle of a crowd, look at me and how great I am. Be impressed with me. Love me. Adore me. I have skills and talents that you should, you should be grateful you get to be in my presence. While we might not do that, we can subtly express very refined ways of pride like always bringing the conversation back to ourselves again and again. Or the constant conversation and talking with others is always about our woundedness and about how badly things have gone for us. It can take its form in the form, pride in the form of self-pity. Woe is me. Help me. Love me. I am greater. My need and my weakness and my sin is greater than God's grace and his love. I just, woe is me. It is not wrong to bring your weakness to others. But when pride is in our heart for the purpose of making them love us or worship us, 
or to bring the attention upon us, we must be suspicious of our hearts. Love is not proud or boastful. It is not centered on us. Love is humble, and love is others-focused. Love is focused on God and his glory and other people, not us. And so when we are arrogant, we tear away the very relationship we have with God himself, and we destroy the relationship that we have together as the body of Christ. Love is not only not arrogant, it is not rude. And the English translation here for this Greek word is a, is a bit rough for rude. What's behind it is actually to communicate someone who be, behaves shamefully, dis, disgracefully, someone who consistently lacks the display of God's grace in their life. The Corinthians have been behaving shamefully and disgracefully towards God and each other as they've lived out with these very idolatry worships in their hearts. Whether it's head coverings or eating the meal of the Lord's Supper, they have done it rudely, shamefully, without grace. Christ's love cares too much for the rest of the body to behave in rude or disgraceful ways. This isn't just take off superficial fruit and pack on, so take off rudeness and put on politeness. It's a heart issue that says, take off me from the center and Christ at the center that then has an effect that I want others to know that love and that grace from Christ. Love is not rude. Love does not insist on its own way, which is what the Corinthians have been doing essentially every turn and almost every day. It's why in chapter 10, it's ultimately, as we talked about their rights and their freedoms, it's not ultimately about their right to eat foods, but about the good of others. In its essence, this is the fullest expression of love. It doesn't seek its own, is another way of saying this. Love does not seek its own. Love does not believe that you need to find yourself or live your truth to find your greatest good. Love is not enamored with self-gain or self-justification or self-worth. Love seeks the good of others, both neighbor and enemy, without regard for its own way in self. To quote John Piper, he says, Love seeks its joy and its gain in the good of others, not just personal gratification. That, this means that the strength of your personal convictions must be in right proportion to God's as found in Scripture. So when you have a personal conviction or enjoyment that isn't explicitly stated by Scripture, we must be careful and wise and discerning and ultimately loving towards the others who don't share the conviction that we do. Love seeks the good of many and not just the comfort of its own self. Love is not irritable. I won't ask for a show of hands because I know that everyone here knows what irritation is. Love does not arouse someone to anger. Love isn't cantankerous. It doesn't get into fits of anger or outbursts. One who truly loves is not easily provoked to anger by those around them, nor do they provoke others to anger. No one likes to be interrupted, right? Does anybody like interruption? Does anybody enjoy having, being halted in the direction you're headed? Say, oh, this is great. I was making such great progress. And now I get to stop for you. We don't, we don't like it when things are going well even more so, right? We can be doing normal tasks and be interrupted and feel that at least subtly. But when things are going well, how much more so do we feel the irritation of l being interrupted? We don't like delays in our plans. We all have a strong craving for a trouble-free life. I guarantee you if some resort in the tropics offered a trouble-free experience, they would be overwhelmed with humanity and booked out for the rest of time on earth. We want a trouble-free life, and yet so often we do not live trouble-free lives, and when that happens, we get irritated and angry when our plans are interrupted. We don't like traffic delays when we have some place to be. We don't like car trouble on vacation. 
We don't like babies that cry through the night. We don't like unexpected expenses on a tight budget. We don't like air conditioners that break in the middle of summer. We don't like camping in Florida ever. And we all know that airplanes are not from the Lord. We don't like it when others don't do what we think they should, and then it affects us. We're okay with somebody doing what they want as long as it affects only them. But not so much when your decision that I did not agree with, did not support, did not encourage, now affects me. We like it when life just flows according to pleasure and comfort and enjoyment and trouble-free. But we need to be careful and we need to see that when we say a statement like that, it can be a right statement that we say, yes, it's an accurate statement. I like those things. But what we really mean is not just life trouble free, but my life by my design, designed by my plans, by my purposes, by all of my details, uninterrupted, is what I mean. And when those things are broken up, when those things are interrupted, when those things are devastated and destroyed, what our flesh produces is irritation and provocation. Love is not irritable or easily provoked. It is long-suffering and actively good. And love is also not resentful. It keeps no record of wrongs. Or another way of translation is, to, is it, keep, it says it keeps literally no books on evil. No books on evil. No, no written records. No mind records. No heart records towards others. A resentful person keeps a record of wrongs with the intention of paying them back at some point. Love does not devise evil against someone else. God does not count, oh, God does not graciously and incredibly count our sins against us. He has taken the record of our wrongs, the record of our sins, and he has nailed them to the cross once and for all. So we too who are his are not to take record of the wrongs done against us and let God settle the record as he wills. It does not keep a record of wrong. Love forgives. It does not hold a grudge. And when it's tempted, love, instead of saying, I'm going to pay you back in kind, says, I'm going to pay you back with better. And not better revenge or better anger, but with the better grace and love of Jesus Christ. Love is not resentful, and, and love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Th these are be taken together. We can't really pull them apart. Love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. The one who is full of love joins in rejoicing on the side of all things of Christ that reflect the gospel. For every victory gained in Christ, every forgiveness offered, every act of kindness. We don't just... There's meant to be an action that happens, not just, oh, I see God doing something in your life over there, and I just think here quietly to myself in my seat, that's really cool, and I'm rejoicing and happy with you. There is meant to be an action. A rejoicing action means going and celebrating and thanking and expressing and involving yourself in the gospel work of others. That's go that God is doing. It's not just quiet agreement. It's not just simple affirmations. Like, it's not on the golf course, it's not a golf clap for Christian in the Christian community. It's like, well done, you who have faith. No, it's a big deal. The gospel is a big deal. It's, we are to rejoice in the, what we might call the simple victories gained in Christ in everyday life while also refusing to delight in the evil or the fall of a brother or a sister or a child's misdeeds or your mortal enemy. Love absolutely rejects evil and sin in all of its forms. It will not allow gossip or slander. It will not allow an emotion that is happy when someone gets what they deserve as they fall into sin. Love stands on the side 
of the truth and the affection of the gospel and looks for mercy and justice for all, including those who you disagree with. Love doesn't just reject the truth, suppress the truth, or exchange the truth. It doesn't do anything against the truth. Love rejoices with the truth of the gospel. You come to the end of verse 7. The most quoted line at every wedding. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Paul is using in his language here all things which can be taken both as in everything and always. And he's not making a separation, meaning so in everything and always love is. The first and the last mention, so bears all things and endures all things, are similar in that they deal with present circumstances, situations of everyday life. And the middle two, believes all things and hopes all things, are similar that deal with looking to the future. Love bears and endures all things. There is meaning, there's nothing that love cannot face. Gordon Fee says, love has a tenacity in the present, buoyed by its absolute confidence in the future that enables it to live in every kind of circumstance and continually pour out itself on the behalf of others. There is nothing that love cannot face, even the situation or the person that may come to mind right now. Love never loses faith and never loses hope. It doesn't, mean that, that it, it doesn't mean that we always just believe the best about everything and everyone, but that it never loses faith. It never loses hope because it is anchored in Christ alone. One who has received the love of Christ is enabled by the Spirit to love others in the same way, which means you can love, trust God, and hopes in God always and in everything for others. The simplest, most culturally contextual way to say what Scripture is saying here is to use the modern philosophizer Rick Astley. Love's never going to give you up, Eric. Probably one of your favorite artists, right, Eric? Love's never going to give you up or let you down. It's not going to run around or desert you. It's not going to make you cry. It's not going to say goodbye. It's not going to tell or lie or hurt you. We could rewrite these words in the negative from Paul's to also say the same thing. Love never tires of support, never loses faith, never exhausts hope, never gives up. And I don't know about you, but I need those reminders every day. And so what do you do with what is love? The first step, there are two points of application to the character of love. And the first step in responding is first and foremost to consider the primary character of love in human history. Christ. And then apply this love to ourselves as those who are recipients of God's always active and in everything love. We know what love is because Jesus defines it for us. We know what love is because Jesus gives it to us. Jesus himself is personified on the words of this page. We could just as easily replace Jesus with the noun love in Scripture here, where it would say Jesus is patient or long-suffering and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not irritable or resentful. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but Jesus rejoices with the truth. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. We must turn, if we do not, and this could be a dangerous thing to say, if we do not feel the love of God, it's not because the love of God is broken. It's because we need to be lovingly helped by the grace of God. We turn first to the primary character of love so that love of Christ will have its full way within you. And then the second part of application is to hear Paul's exhortation of this passage and be characterized by the love of Christ. 
He describes the personal nature of love that points to Christ so that we are exhorted to love like this. The point of application from these verses would serve us best by replacing now our own name in the place of love and evaluating ourselves with with repentance in one hand and the grace and forgiveness of Christ in the other. Meaning, am I patient and kind? Do I envy or boast? Am I arrogant and rude? Do I insist on my own way? Am I irritable or resentful? Do I I rejoice in wrongdoings? Do I rejoice in the truth? Do I bear all things and not just some things? Do, Do I believe all things or am I quick to judge others? Do I hope all things or do I doubt God? Do I endure all things or am I quick to run away and give up? No one measures up but Christ alone. And that's why we first turn to the character, the primary character of love, and then motivated by love and completely imperfectly, we seek to be characterized by the love of Christ for all of our days here on earth together. So as we do this, as we remind ourselves of Christ and do this imperfectly and yet faithfully, let us love others so the character of love is seen in our lives, so the character of love is felt in others. And lastly, and I do briefly, Paul finishes with the permanence of love. Read along with me in verses 8 through 13. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul began this chapter with a set of contrasts to show that the gifts and good works do not benefit a person if they do not have love. In other words, love is completely necessary for the Christian. And now following the character of love, he brings his argument to a close with another set of contrasts. Love in contrast to the gifts is both now And forever. The gifts are for now. The present age that we live in until Christ returns is when the gifts are for. That which is for now and forever, therefore, love must dictate how the the gifts which are for now are to function within the church. And all these verses are about the permanence of love. Love itself is actually mentioned very little in these four verses. What forms the majority of content is that things pass away. The Corinthians thought that the gift of tongues meant that they were already participating in the ultimate reality of eternity. The sort of, they were already in a spiritual state that is both now and forever. And it's not that gifts are the ultimate state of spirituality, it's that love is. And Paul isn't condemning the gifts, nor seeking to discourage their seeking the gifts, or seeking to discourage good works. He's putting them in their proper place. And so he says in verse 8, gifts will pass away. In verse 9, they are partial and not the full measure of perfection. In verse 11, they are as childhood in comparison to adulthood. And in verse 12, they are like looking into a mirror in comparison with seeing someone in person. The gifts are provisional, and love is permanent. So eagerly desire love. Eagerly desire and practice the gifts as a means of glorifying God and building others up. Another way of simply saying this is what Jesus himself said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. Gifts will come and go. 
Skills and strength will fade. Governments will rise and fall. Cultures will change and come right back around. There will be many things that seem new under the sun, but all is really the same. Love is permanent and necessary and sufficient for life now and remain through all of eternity. All else fades. Faith, hope, and love will remain, but the greatest of these is love. The reason that faith and hope will fade in turn is because we will no longer need, to know, need them to know God. We will see him and know him truly as we ourselves are known, and we won't be waiting in hope for him to come because we will be in his presence forever, where love is known and on display and lived out for eternity. Paul's instruction to the Corinthians has many direct implication. He wants them to see and value and pursue love towards one another and not super spiritually over and against one another. He wants them to pursue the gifts of the Spirit as a temporary means on earth to the ultimate end of loving God and one another. I want to give just two points of application, and I don't know if Manny and Wayne have been talking. We're going to close with a song. Manny, you can come back now if we're going to close. The first point of application for the church today, just as it was when the letter was written, is let us love God and one another ultimately and desire the gifts. As we've been talking about in this series in our midweek meetings, as we've been praying and asking God to do, let us love God first and foremost with all that we are, and then let us desire the gifts of the Spirit to visibly make known God among us and build one another up. It's simple, and yet... It's principled, which means it goes, beyond, it goes beyond and into all circumstances. And the second point of application is similar. Because love is permanent, it must be foundational. Because love is foundational in our relationship with God, it must be foundational in our relationships together. Which means that our relationships can't be based on or built on anything other than the love of Christ. We can enjoy common interests and preferences, sports teams and hobbies, categories of life, but they cannot be the primary foundation or basis or interaction of our relationships together. This means that we don't use others for our comfort or our benefits. It means that the love of Christ characterizes us in all things. It means that our relationship and fellowship with one another isn't based on convenience or situational context, or those hobbies or the preferences, but only for the glory of God and the other-centered living that truly seeks to build one another up. If you find yourself, if you find something other than love in your relationship with someone else, then go in love for the glory of God and the goodness of your relationship to that person and pursue relationship and fellowship with them that is characterized by what we see here in the pages of Scripture. When the love of Christ is known and extended and lived, there is grace in abundance for each person in the body of Christ. So let us not love the temporary things of this world, no matter how good they are, but let us love the eternal one and all the people, all of his people with the never-ending, not easily affected, not easily offended love of Christ, which is the most excellent of ways. Spirit of God, I pray I pray that, that we would love you first and foremost, that we would not mistake or misplace or prize the gifts that you give us in our life, whether spiritual or practical or any gifts, as the end unto itself, that you would guard us from personal worship and idolatry, that you would appropriately convict and give grace to turn and run away from those things. Lord, I pray for any, any hurts and offenses, any relational discomfort, any form of relational strife, Lord, that exists. I pray that it is as we turn our eyes upon you, the loving one, that all of those would be swallowed up in that grace and love of Christ that as we see our own sinfulness and humbled by your love 
and steadfastness and your loving kindness that is vast as the sea, that is wide as the ocean, that we would be that our, our strife and sin and temptation would be swallowed up in them and all obstacles that we might place between us and others would be removed and that we would go in the love of Christ, not for ourselves, but for the building up of your church. I pray that we would see the absolute need for love in all things and that we would not take it for granted, that we would not treat it as a commodity to be used when it benefits us, but that it would be in all things and always all things. I pray that we would be characterized by the love of Christ himself increasingly so. And I pray that love be foundational and permanent to us and among us in all things. All for your glory and by your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.